This is Wednesday's Women, hosted by Caitlin and Taylor. We invite you to join us in a candid conversation about the roles of women in political organizing and beyond as we celebrate the centennial celebration of the 19th Amendment. We hope that you find this ed- episode educational, entertaining, and the women we discuss inspiring. If you like what you hear, subscribe and share. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Wednesday's Women. We are filming at 8.35 p.m., so if we seem tired, we are. Um, Today, we are going to be talking about Hattie Purvis, and she is a very neat lady, and I was really interested about listening to her story because um, she did a lot with multiple types of activism. Yes, so Harriet Davy Fortin was born in 1810. She was born to free parents, but no official date is listed for her birthday. They just know she was born in 1810. Um, Again, they didn't really have great records back then for really anyone. Um, She was one of eight children to James Fortin and Charlotte Van Dyne Fortin, both James and Charlotte were prominent in the Philadelphia area, and James was a wealthy inventor, businessman, and known abolitionist who was also born a freedman. Um, Fortin, James Fortin was born in 1766 and was a powder boy, and actually ended up being taken prisoner from the Royal Lewis during the Revolutionary War. So he was well known in his town and did kind of have a fun backstory. Um, Also interesting to note, James Fortin was biracial, so that was like a big deal back then, Um, and it does come into play later in Harriet Fortin's life. So James Fortin, after being freed from his prisoner of war moment, establishes a private school with Grace Douglas um, in the Philadelphia area, and Harriet and all of her siblings attended this school Um, They were also taught foreign languages and music by additional private tutors. So she was um, very privileged in that she was very well educated and very well rounded. Um, She married in her family's home on September 13th, 1831 to Robert Purvis from South Carolina. Robert Purvis, like her father, was a very wealthy man. but he was a very light-skinned black man. They were married by an Episcopal bishop in an elegant ceremony. It was described as elegant by attendees and by local papers because again, um, both the Fortins and the Purvises were fairly prominent in their own towns. This um, union actually did cause some ruckus just because Purvis was light-skinned and Fortin was not. And so some people thought it was um, a mixed race union, which was very frowned upon at the time and actually illegal. So you were not allowed to marry a mixed race in every state. Um, So this was a big point of gossip all throughout their marriage. Um, After, so Harriet ends up passing before Robert. After Harriet's passing, Robert does end up marrying a white woman which goes over much better because Robert was so fair-skinned. So just interesting to note. So they remained in the Philadelphia area until 1842 when they were forced to relocate out into the countryside because their home was being targeted by white mobs. So on top of being perceived as a mixed-race union, they were also outspoken abolitionists and just very prominent in the community. Um, on top of being black, so white mobs had a huge issue with them. Um, Both in the city and in the countryside, they employed servants, including an English governess, which made it possible for Harriet to actively work on the causes important to her and for Robert to maintain a job while both of them maintaining parental roles and just maintaining the status of their household. So it's a lot harder to host a dinner party when you're attending a suffragette meeting and then an abolitionist meeting and your husband's working late. And then, of course, (laughs) you know, I think she had something like five or six kids. Um, So that's... um, 
Harriet Purvis died on June 11, 1875 of tuberculosis. She died after, I believe, three of her children died of tuberculosis, and then two of her sons died of unrelated causes. So she was preceded in death by several of her children. Um, so that is tragic. She also, if you noticed, died before the passage of the 19th Amendment. Yeah. And like we said, she was very lucky in her life that she was able to afford having help with her home and with her children because it, was, it gave her that opportunity to go off and focus on um, social reform. And that's kind of what I'm going to go through with you guys. So firstly, as an abolitionist, so she was a member of the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society and while pregnant, attended the Women's Anti-Slavery Convention in New York in 1837 with two of her sisters. Very important to note that these types of events were not seen without conflict. Um, we're going to talk about here about some riots that occurred at some conventions she attended. It was very noble to go there while pregnant because I'm sure she would have recognized the danger of being there and possible injury that she could have had. Um, in 1838, the convention was held in Philly at um, the new Pennsylvania Hall, which was built by the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society. Whenever they first came to this convention, her husband, who we'd already noted about his um, outward appearance, did not appear to be um, mixed race. He helped his wife out of the carriage and people assumed that he was white and they became very angry and they were looking at them and thinking that they were promoting amalgamation of the races. Um, and just to see that that response to them walking in together kind of shows what was going to happen further on once the convention started. So not long after the hall was destroyed because it was set afire by groups of people who were pro-slavery. Um, the convention thankfully then convened at a teacher and abolitionist house or school, excuse me, it was Sarah Poff's school. And in this organization, it was very interesting that black and white women participated as equals. And that's interesting because at that time that was a rarity. And not to being put off by the rides the previous year, Harriet did end up attending the convention the following two years. And at those conventions, she was a delegate in 38 and 1839. Um, but they were unable to rent a hall in Philly in 1839, and the convention met at a riding stable. Harriet co-chaired the Philadelphia Women's anti-slavery society fairs, which occurred between 1840 and 1861. And these events were very helpful because they actually were able to raise $32,000, which is equivalent to $983,000 in 2019. So that's crazy. It's a lot of money, almost a million dollars. Yeah. Um, in 1841, the group at Ray, wow, I'm gonna start that over. <laughs> In 1841, the group rallied against the exclusion of black Sunday schools at the annual Sunday school exhibition in Independence Square. And the following year, it was a biracial event. After the 13th Amendment was passed, Purvis continued her efforts to improve the rights of African Americans. So she didn't see, it's almost kind of like we were talking with Alice Paul, just because the original goal was met, she didn't decide to stop her activism. She saw that there were other necessary things that needed to occur to make sure equality was sought and met. Mm -hmm. And the Female Anti-Slavery Society continued to meet, and in September 1866, they discussed the status of the South. So Robert and Harriet became involved with the Pennsylvania State Equal Rights League and American Equal Rights Association and served on the executive committee. A major project for her after the 13th Amendment was education. To her, they saw the importance that black families be given the same educational opportunities as white families, which is something that I think still is a big issue. We talk a lot about um, gerrymandering and the separation of lines between, um, I know with the Housing, housing Act. Yeah, like redlining. Yeah, making where 
funding goes to certain locations and it isn't co um, coincident that these locations are split by race, which also is by income. So people that are already struggling socially don't have it as easy as other races and economic statuses to climb the ladder and reach higher levels of living. Yeah, it's also important to note that at this time, a lot of prominent African-American families were hiring private tutors. And so they did this in Purvis's family. And the idea was they knew that the education their black children were receiving was not the same education that white children were receiving. And so they were trying to fill in those gaps that they were seeing. So she was sort of experiencing it firsthand. And I know there was some mention of her niece coming to live with her at one point. And she was teaching her niece as well as hiring other private tutors to educate her niece. Um, and there's a play called Aunt Harriet about her niece, letters to Aunt Harriet, I think, about her niece living there and being educated there. So it was a very prominent, like, issue that everyone sort of recognized and just didn't talk about. Yeah, and I mean, I think that it's w worth noting that I think there are still issues of that today where there is differences in education and especially in historical education. Um, I know I just read an article a couple days ago about how the Civil War is written, depending on who wrote it and where the story is going to be taught at, textbooks will write it differently and explain the Civil War through different historical perspectives, basically. Which, it's not a bad thing to have different perspectives on record but you shouldn't only be learning one perspective. Like the textbook should be including every perspective they're publishing. Yeah. So we, we don't want to come off like it's a bad thing to have different perspectives. You absolutely should, because sometimes people fight for something thinking it's the right thing that they're fighting for, and it's really not. But and the issue comes when you only show that perspective and you don't show the perspective of the people who are being hurt by this. Mm -hmm. And not to compare the Civil War to this, because that isn't what I'm trying to do. I'm just, that just made me think of it. So please do not take this out of context. But those who fought and were Nazis were taught that that wasn't even occurring. Like the, um, the Holocaust, they weren't even aware, a lot of them, that that was occurring. They weren't fighting in the, ho like, they weren't at concentration camps they weren't even aware that these things were happening they thought it was fake news so that just goes to show you there's so much going on that perspective there can be so many perspectives you know yeah so i mean it is important to address them mm -hmm, but absolutely. it shouldn't just be their perspectives taught mm -hmm. and the next thing i'm going to talk about is my favorite antidote about Harriet. So she became in what is called the Free Produce Society. So as we know, um, a big reason why slavery took so long to be abolished was the fact that the South heavily uh, relied on the slaves to help produce the produce and the cotton and everything else, that the tobacco that they created to sell. Without them, it was almost impossible to um, keep up with the workload and to continue to make the profit that they were used to. So knowing this, sh this society worked to purchase only locally made um, produce and boycott produce grown and picked by slaves. She was often a delegate to the Free Produce Conventions and was a member of the Colored Free Produce Association. Harriet only bought and bought produce and products that were not made or grown by slaves. And then it was an activity she continued even after some, like Garrison, questions it, questioned its effectiveness, which is, I think is a really important thing to note that she continued with it. And that goes to show she's not just trying to make a political statement. That was something she really believed in. Because even after everyone else had given up on that idea because they weren't sure of its effectiveness, she still did it because she knew it was what was right. Yeah, she just followed her morals. And... Just to put some perspective on this, so the North, we live in Pennsylvania. Caitlin and I both live in Pennsylvania. Different areas of Pennsylvania, but nonetheless, we can't grow several vegetables, several 
fruits. They, like, Pennsylvania is mostly rain and snow. And, I, like, little... What? I would love to grow a pineapple. Yeah. Like, there are lots of things that we just can't grow up here that we would have to get from the South or from somewhere else. And so to not be able to get those things and to have the resolve to, like never eat an avocado, to never eat a pineapple again. Like, that's impressive. And if you're trying to think of how difficult that was back then, think of if you're like, I'm only eating American-grown produce now, or if I'm only buying things made in America now. I have family members who do that, which props to them. I think it's great, but it's nearly impossible. And I think, too, it goes to show she was in a very – um very fortunate situation that she had the ability to do that because I'm sure her financial situation played a role in that. I know I just had a conversation yesterday with a lady about how they don't go to Walmart because they feel that Walmart is really hard on local businesses, which I completely agree with. But with a lot of people, Walmart is so much cheaper than other grocery stores, anything locally owned, because locally owned businesses get less support so they typically have to hire raise their prices to be able to meet meet ends meet make ends meet and i think it shows her privilege that she was able to work around that and still get what she needed and the things like this are still being done today so there is currently a movement i will say that as of march 2020 there was still a movement to boycott Wendy's and a couple other fast food restaurants because they refused to purchase produce from farms that sign a pledge to not abuse their workers. So some farms are using, paying their workers less than minimum wage, covering up sexual assault scandals. And so some fast food chains have signed on. I think McDonald's has signed. I think Taco Bell has signed. And all the pledge says is we won't buy from these farms because they are continuing this stigma of farm labor is less than other labor and we can abuse these workers. And Wendy's refuses to do so. And so I know a lot of people in Clarion who won't eat at Wendy's because they won't. I don't eat at Wendy's very often, mostly because I don't like it. And so I don't tell people I boycott Wendy's. Because to me, that's not a boycott if I just already wasn't eating at it. Um, But, like, a lot of people won't eat at Chick-fil-A because of their values. I won't eat at Chick-fil-A because of their values. Same. I have a similar issue with Hobby Lobby. Yes, Hobby Lobby is a big deal. Again, I don't tell people that I boycott Hobby Lobby because there isn't a Hobby Lobby near me to boycott. So it feels like... But if ever given the opportunity to boycott a Hobby Lobby, I would do it. <laughs> That's my issue. I like Hobby Lobby. Like, I like their stuff. I really do. I, I like crafts. Taylor and I have been talking about it. I am a, an avid crafty person. I enjoy it. It brings me joy. I like Hobby Lobby. It hurts me that I can't go in there. <laughs> That's how much I, li- I like their, their products. It's just that I can't because I know that it, they're wrong in my eyes. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. If you're supporting someone economically, you're supporting their morals, whether you intend to or not. Exactly right. Yep, I completely agree. The other big um, activity that Harriet took part in was the Underground Railroad. So her and her husband were revered for their founding of the Pennsylvania, not Pennsylvania, sorry, Philly Vigilance Committee. Um, They also used their home as a stop on the railroad. They later moved the stop out of the city and into the countryside when things in the city got dangerous, like I mentioned, white mobs. They were pro-slavery. They were very confronting, I'm sure. Um, But in their time, they were able to assist about 9,000 runaway slaves along their journey to Canada. Slaves were hidden from authorities in their Byberry house through a trap door that was installed in the floor by her husband, Robert. And Harriet hosted many meetings of abolition Um, at her house there and was the leader of the female vigilant society, which provided monies for transportation and clothing to the travelers. And I just wanted to make note that many people came and spoke with her here on suffrage and slavery. And one person who actually wrote in their diary about her was Susan B. Anthony. And I have a quote here from her diary, which said Harriet Hattie and Georgina, uh, Purvis, who lived in their father's house outside Philly, were heirs to their parents' interest in equal rights for women and African Americans, end quote. 
which I thought was very interesting to see that somebody as prominent as uh, Susan B. Anthony would write about her seeing them and knowing about their morals. And I think sometimes people have misconceptions about houses that were used on the Underground Railroad, that they had to be these big elaborate um, homesteads with like no one around. And sometimes they were because in that case, it was very easy to hide someone. Um, I'm from New Wilmington. So if this was Pennsylvania, I live here. Um, <laughs> fun trick I learned in kindergarten. Um, but in Pennsylvania or in New Wilmington, we actually have two underground railroad houses that supposedly are connected underground, but the tunnels have collapsed since then. And they just kind of look like normal houses. Um, one interesting feature is they're round. Not all underground railroad houses were round. These ones just are. And so they've always been called the round houses. Um, but a lot of these underground railroad houses did have some sort of, I guess, gimmick to them. So this trap door in the floor, the round houses were intentionally built to be round because that provides extra corners. And so when you build square rooms into a round house, you have these awkward gap spaces in the inside. And so you can hide people in those gap spaces. And so there is a lot of um, intentionality in these Underground Railroad houses, but it's not always obvious, this intentionality. So if you had a generally obvious, this is a stop on the Underground Railroad, you're going to get busted a lot. So things like trap doors and extra space in walls are fairly common for Underground Railroad stops. And the idea that there are 9,000 runaway, runaway slaves being assisted is just phenomenal. And also the idea that you're keeping track of that, because if that ever gets out, I mean, you're facing varying penalties from jail time to, I mean, a death sentence sometimes, depending on the state. I don't think PA was using the death sentence for slavery, though. I would imagine not, especially since we're in the North. Yeah, and we, I feel like we freed slaves fairly early on. I think so, but I, I don't know what much about the real. I don't know much one about the Underground Railroad or about um, our early history. I have told Taylor multiple times, I in high school didn't take U.S. honors history because I'm a piece of garbage. And growing up, I had a horrible foundation about history. And that's why it's still really hard for me to keep track of dates and knowing what was happening in the world in reference to our country. So I there's a lot I still need to learn and try to grasp that I feel very sad and that I just don't understand about our government and about the formation of our country. I feel like that's fairly common for like a lot of schools in Pennsylvania though. I feel like we were almost fortunate to have roundhouses in our hometown because that was like a big discussion every year in history class because the teachers would be like, let us tell you about the roundhouse because we never like I swear until the like ninth grade we never got past the civil war. We, like, started the um, Industrial Revolution and ended the Civil War. And, like, that's all we got to. And they'd be like, okay, we'll try again next year. See, now for us, I feel like, here's how it goes. They tell us Columbus found America every year. Oh, yeah, we did hear that a lot. The, the little rhyme. Yeah. And then they, we would jump to, like, the Mayflower. And then we would jump to Abraham Lincoln. And then we would jump to nothing. We got to Abe Lincoln and then it always stopped. And, but we didn't talk very much on slavery at all. Hmm. We never really talked about it a lot. And if you asked one of, we asked one of our teachers once, we're like, why don't we ever talk about like the South and slavery down there? And they're like, because we're a northern state. And I'm like, mm, <laughs> okay. Not well, the response I was looking for, but. I think the response I, for my experience, I mean, I know in my 12th grade history class, obviously this was generic history. It wasn't a honors history. We had multiple students saying that they would like to be a part of the KKK. So like that was hard. 
So, I mean, I guess like if there was a teacher who wanted to teach us about that, they might have felt more uh, concerned. I would like to say we did not have students who said they wanted to be part of the KKK. I will say New Wilmington did not have, I don't think there were any minority students in my grade, but I could be mistaken. I will say lots of trucks had Confederate flags on them. And so history teachers would kind of make fun of students and be like, you guys know we weren't the Confederacy, right? And they're like, it's our heritage. And they were like, no, 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 no. Your, your family's lived here since like the 1800s. It's, it's not your heritage. You weren't like your, your family fought in the North. And so like, I guess we kind of did have kids who, like, I guess if you're flying the Confederate flag, you have some interest in that aspect of living. My issue with that... But no one was like, I want a white hood. Because we would have bullied them relentlessly. See, now, it was the opposite for us. Like, everybody was like, if you are choosing to be more liberal, you know, even though slavery shouldn't be divided by party because that's just a human rights issue that isn't that shouldn't be a political issue um it was kind of at my school and i i i hate that i keep bringing it up to the holocaust but like when people tell me it's whoever i understand it's not our heritage but the heritage of the south if people in germany started flying the nazi flag people would be mad rightfully so but that's their history um actually real quick fast detour and then we'll get back to hattie purvis one it's illegal to fly the nazi flag in germany fun fact they got their stuff together two the stars and bars which is the confederate flag that people typically fly which is like the two blue x's with stars and then red triangles is not what the confederate flag looked like so the Confederate flag was a white flag, and then the corner up here had the stars and bars. And then people were like, dude, the Confederate flag looks like a flag of surrender because it was mostly white. So they added a red strip here. The stars and bars refers to the red and blue all over the flag. And that was not introduced until the 60s and was used by southern states to intimidate black people when they fought for civil rights. So I actually have more respect for you if you fly the actual Confederate flag and you're like, this is part of my history. Cause I'm like, at least you're historically accurate racist. Whereas like, if you're just a stupid racist, then I'm like, mm, I don't even have anything to be like, at least you're historically accurate with. I'm just like, Oh, you bought into the propaganda. Mm-hmm. So if you want to fly the Confederate flag, at least by the right Confederate flag, and I'll just say as a former emo child, Nirvana was a bigger part of the American history than the Confederacy. So I think we should all be flying Nirvana flags. I love Because that was a huge part of our history. But <laughs> back to Hattie Purvis, who would be mortally ashamed of you if you flew the Confederate flag. Just saying. Harriet Purvis was a member of the National Women's As- Woman Suffrage Association and a friend of Susan B. Anthony and Lucreta Mott. Um, she also worked for the right to vote for Blacks and women alongside Susan and Lucreta. Um, she worked against slavery with them and for safe passage of res- refugee slaves. So often these slaves would want to leave the South and start a new life in the North. And so the three of these women with many others would work to facilitate these refugee travels. Harriet and her sister, Margareta Fortin, were key organizers to the Fifth National Women's Rights Convention in Philly in 1854. In 1866, a little over a decade later, they formed the American Equal Rights Association. Harriet joined other active members, including Sarah Remond and Sojourner Truth in public advocacy of voting rights for African-Americans and women So, if you'll recall, there does become a rift in the movement when African-American men get the right to vote before women get the right to vote. Um, So this does sort of show some racist undertones to some of the organizations when they feel like white women should have been given the right to vote before black men. Um, 
So this occurs with the passing of the 15th Amendment, which gives suffrage to former slaves. Um, following this, Harriet joined forces with old friend Susan B. Anthony and united with the National Women's Suffrage Association once again to support an amendment for women's suffrage. So up until this point, they had pretty much been fighting on a state-by-state -state basis. And then the women's suffrage movement sees this broad sweeping 15th Amendment, which provides suffrage to freed Black men. Um, there were still some caveats to it, um, but for the most part, Black men could vote, which was upsetting to both white and Black women, but for different reasons. Um, black women felt that just it should have just said everyone can now vote. There was no reason to differentiate. But some white women felt like they were still above black people. And so giving black men the right to vote before them put them at a lower pedestal than they believed. And so that's what really caused the rift in that movement. Um, and that's really where you start to see um, groups sort of breaking up and saying, we don't want to work with you anymore. And now, we would like to talk about our discussion questions for this week. So, first discussion question. Was employing servants during this time with low wages, minimal protections, unstable working conditions, a hypocritical move in the fight to end slavery? I think so, because it's almost like you're throwing, you're saying you're not doing what was being done but you're not doing the right thing still. You're not still treating them as equals. So I agree. Um, there is some discussion on this with the idea that servants are paid and slaves are not. Um, you're not allowed to abuse your servants. Your servants still have bodily autonomy and rights. I'm not saying, I don't feel that paying servants is the same as slavery. I just feel that it's still a hypocritical move because what people are going to say is, if you remember when we discussed um, Sojourner Truth, who was sold as a child, that poor people were owning slaves. Um, this was a rich woman who could afford a servant and could afford to pay what was still low wages. Um, back then, servants and domestic workers had no employment protections, no economic protections. Um, it was work was here one day, gone the next. There were no, like, unemployment wasn't really a thing. So the idea that this rich woman could afford it, but still needed a servant to run her household. And so you're saying you can't keep these people like this. And I agree, you can't own another human being. But people are going to devalue your movement because they're going to say, you can't even run a household without a servant. How are, how are these farms supposed to send us avocados for our avocado toast every summer if they don't have servants? Mm -hmm. And that was a big part of the argument for slavery that was hard for abolitionists to fight was the economic aspect. And it doesn't make it right just because it was economically bountiful. But they would say, we will see an economic crash if we abolish slavery. What was their comeback supposed to be to that? Especially when you're dependent on a servant in your home. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point to bring up. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think... And I think it also... Go ahead. It's definitely hypocritical, but I see the point that it was until things could be, it had to be like a gradual transition, almost economically, not saying it's still the right move because economic reasons, as we're seeing right now, like, for example, with the coronavirus, economic reasons shouldn't precede humans, human rights, I would say. But I do understand the benefit of a slower transition but even if we would have did the low wages, I wish they would have still, I still feel like it's hypocritical because they didn't provide them other human rights in unstable working conditions, minimal protections, not going to be making sure that they have uh, reliable sources of income, et cetera. And you're continu continuing this hierarchy 
yeah. uh, wealthy, um, you know, wealthy above you power struggles, which you don't really want to continue because that's really the second aspect of slavery. The first aspect is this idea that like you own another human being and you economically benefit from their labor without giving them any benefits. But the second aspect is just a general power hierarchy. So, you know, I have a lot of power over you. And while, no, she wasn't whipping her servants, I don't think she did this, but say a servant made her mad one day and she fires this servant and then tells everyone in the town this servant was stealing pocket change out of our bedroom. That servant's not getting work anymore. Yeah. Like, you still have this power hierarchy. So I do think it was hypocritical. I don't think that detracts everything from what she did. Like, I don't think it makes her less impressive or less her contributions less impressive. I just think it's a little hypocritical. Yeah, absolutely. And the second question, there were a number of affluent white suffragettes and their allies who proposed a women's suffrage amendment that would grant voting rights only to women who could read and write English, which they called educated suffrage. Why do you think they would propose that? And who do you think would have been left out? Um, I think a big reason why people would have proposed that is they don't see, like you said, there's that hierarchy and you don't recognize that the people below you have, they should have the same rights as you. And the reason why they're uneducated is because they're not being given the opportunities you're being given. But just because they're not being provided the same opportunities doesn't mean you stop them from having the rights that you do. And for, and those rights to which will increase their ability to have more uh, full lives and more choices to their experience in life. I agree. I also think one of the reasons they said, one of the reasons they proposed that, I mean, one, there were suffragettes who were racist. Quite frankly, we pick the suffragettes we do, and we try to sort of screen who we're doing to make sure we're not picking abhorrently racist people, because I don't think we should celebrate abhorrently racist people, but quite frankly, there were racist suffragettes. I'm just going to put that out there. The second thing is men often saw women as less than. And so this idea of them saying, no, 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 we wouldn't let every woman vote, just educated women, women who you see on par with you, it's easier for men to sort of swallow this idea that it's not a foolish woman walking in picking the prettiest face for mayor. It's a woman who is a socialite and attends these benefits and these fundraisers and these social dinners and all of this. And so I think they thought that might benefit them a little bit and might ease the passage. Um, it would disproportionately affect low income people and recently freed slaves and black people. It would. Um, so I do think suffragettes being a little racist played into that. And I think the people who would have been left out definitely would have been people, of, women of color. It would have been lower class women. It would have been immigrants. It would have been people who, even if they, oh, able-bodied people, I'm sure would have probably been added into that majority. I don't think I'm leaving anybody else out. <laughs> I don't think. And last question, just because we've been sharing some people on our See You Engage social media, do you think had the movement been more intersectional, so included Chinese women, included Native American women, um, made an effort to be more inclusive to Black women, do you think the amendment would have been passed sooner or would have been passed later? Later, unfortunately. Because I think, like we were saying, unfortunately, history is written by those with power. And the people in power at the time were white men. 
And I think, like you said, it's a hard pill to swallow. They already were having a hard time thinking that women should have the rights that they have. And if they would have had more women being included, you mean, you meant in the party of like the suffrage party, right? In the suffrage movement, or did you mean, okay, yeah. No, I definitely think it would have been harder just because they would have, like you said, seen that as like, oh, well, maybe if there's a woman who's educated and she's white and she's sophisticated, maybe she should get to vote. But if you say to me, oh, a person who is low income and they aren't the same ethnicity as me or the same race, oh, well, you know, I can't step into their shoes because they're so different than me. I don't know if they should have the same rights as me. Yeah, I agree. I do think it would have taken longer. I mean, also just this idea that like a lot of a lot of minorities weren't even recognized as citizens for a long time. You figure even, like, if if your parents immigrated from China, but you were born on American soil, you still weren't considered an American citizen because your parents were Chinese. Mm -hmm. So I think that would have definitely played a big part in delaying it. Um, personally, I still would have liked to have seen the suffrage movement be more intersectional. I still think you know, Native Americans should have had a seat at the table. Chinese descendants and all Asian descendants should have had a seat at the table because that is something we don't really talk about. When they mention Chinese back in the 1800s, they really just mean all Asian. They just blankly refer to them as Chinese, which isn't okay. Like if someone just said to me, oh, you're North American, I'd be like, ah, no. <laughs> Like, I'm not, or if someone said to me, you're Canadian, I'd be like, mm, no, <laughs> I close, but not quite. I wonder if that's what happens to like Canadian people when they go like somewhere in Europe, because they have very similar, um, they, ve they have very few accent derivatives and, you know. I feel like if they go over there, they'd be like, oh, you're American. Well, you don't know. And they'd be like, I'm not even American. This is going to sound like really stereotypical, but I feel like it might happen less just because Canadian students are often bilingual. They're often taught two languages. Right. Yeah. So I feel like they, like, Americans travel. I can honestly say I studied abroad in Costa Rica for two weeks and would just blankly stare at people when they spoke to me. Like, if they spoke too quickly, I'd be like, uh, okay, see. Like, I was an idiot. I literally went to a foreign country and didn't speak the language. And then, like, when I would be back here and people would be like, they need to speak English, I was like, no, they don't. I went to Costa Rica and spoke minimal Spanish. Like, could order my food, could ask where the restroom was. Like, I could do, like, survival phrases. But if someone wanted to, like, have a discussion, I was like, oh, sorry, bud. Can you type it on my phone? <laughs> how do you say bathroom? This isn't how you say bathroom. This is how you say toilet. El baño. <laughs> I thought it was baño. I took it for <laughs> a few years. I took it for four and remembered very little. Which I did have a break for two years because I didn't take, I took French when I got to college. Um, and yeah, that was rough. I, Costa Rica was beautiful. I'd do it again, but not knowing the language was rough. Yeah, I'm sure. So to surprise Taylor, this week I'm going to talk about next week's episode. Because I forgot that we were going to talk about Hattie Purvis today, and I researched a bunch on Stella Goslin Cowan, who is and well, was the first numerator for the U.S. Census in the 1800s. And we're going to talk about her next week. We're also going to talk a lot about the census and the importance of census this year, since this is a census year. If you haven't done your census, shame on you. You should go and do it at the Census Bureau on the internet since you can do that this year. This is the first year in history you can do it on the internet, so you should do that. And if you don't, shame on you. <laughs> you should also, this Saturday, head over to at CU underscore engaged on Instagram and play a round of census trivia. This week, we'll focus on participation rates of different states and regions in the United States, so see where your state stacks up. 
Are you a high participation rate state? Are you a low participation rate state? Do they think that only 30 people live in your state? Which has happened before. We know it's not true, but if only 30 people answer, exactly. guess you get $200. Because <laughs> it does determine your funding, your federal funding. So yeah. that is important to note. And something that we're going to talk about next week is the importance of women and why women specifically this year need to come out more than they have in past years because yes. it has negatively affected women the last uh, decade. All right, so this has been Wednesday's Women. We hope you guys have enjoyed and we will see y'all next week. This has been Wednesday's Women, sponsored by the Clarion University CU Engaged Coalition. The thoughts and ideas presented in this podcast are meant to be for entertainment purposes first and foremost, and we do not claim to be experts in any field. As always, thanks for listening, and make sure you go out and register to vote.